Hello friends, this is Evangelist Scott Pauley and I want to greet you on this Resurrection Sunday morning. What a privilege it is to study the Word of God with you. We're having to do it from a distance and of course that was not our plan but we believe this is all the providence of God. Now, the Lord knew all of this when the meeting was scheduled and I just thank your pastor for the privilege uh, to preach to you at this particular time and to have a part in the work of the Lord that's going on there in Brunswick, Georgia. I love your church. I remember being there for a revival meeting and the great time we had together and the Spirit of the Lord. And uh, I told the folks this week, the only thing I really hate about us meeting together this way is that I don't get to go to Willie's and get a hot dog. So uh, you'll have to send me one through the mail, perhaps. But I am thrilled uh, to get to spend the next three days with you studying the Word of God. And what an appropriate Sunday to begin a revival meeting. And may the Spirit of the living God speak to all of us this week in a very special way. I want you to take the Word of God with me and open it, if you will, to the book of 1 John in the New Testament. Now, on this Resurrection Sunday, most of the time, we would take you to the Gospel according to John. We would take you to one of the Gospel records and look at the story of the resurrection itself. But I want to show you, if I may, the rest of the story today. We're going to let John speak to us under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And of course, John was the disciple that leaned on Jesus' breast at supper. He was the beloved apostle. He was the one who was as close and intimate with our Lord as any of the disciples were. And if any of them knew the Lord, I mean really knew not just about Him, knew His heart, I believe John was such a man. And so when you come to the little book of 1 John, uh, this apostle that knew the Lord so well, had such close fellowship with Him, begins to describe for us our living Savior. Look at 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ the righteous. One of the reasons that I love all of John's writings, and they're very tender and precious to me, is that John loved to talk about one thing. Now, we might say it this way. He loved to talk about one person. He loved to talk about Jesus. May I tell you, that's what the Holy Spirit loves to talk about. The Holy Spirit loves to talk about Jesus. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you really love Him, I want you to know you're going to love to talk about Jesus. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no name like the name of Jesus Christ. Someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so on this Resurrection Sunday, we turn our attention away from the news, away from the government, away from what's going on in our world, away from every distraction. We turn our eyes and attention away from all of that and we fix our attention on the only one who is the conqueror, the only one who has overcome, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now John, in all of his writings, loves to describe for us the Lord Jesus. In fact, hold your place here in 1 John just a minute and go back with me to John chapter 1 for a second, if you will. Go to John chapter 1, uh, the gospel according to John, and you're going to see something, I think, very familiar. Notice how he begins his gospel record. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Same points of emphasis that he begins later in his epistle, in his letter. Uh, Christ as the Word, Christ as the life, Christ as the light. I tell you, John just always lifting up Jesus, lifting up Jesus. In the gospel record, he points to Jesus as our salvation. Aren't you glad he's our salvation? I hope you know him as your personal Savior. And if you don't, friend, today's the day. Today's the day of salvation. And you'll get an opportunity in just a moment to call upon him and be saved. Jesus is our salvation. Then when you come to the three little letters that John wrote, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, He's not only our salvation, He's our sanctification. 
You see, when you got saved, that wasn't the end, my brother, my sister. That was the beginning. The Lord is working in you to make you more like Jesus. And so that's really what the letters are all about. And then when you come to the last book that John wrote, and the last book of the Bible, the Revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in it, we discover that Jesus is not only our salvation and our sanctification, but praise be to God, He's our glorification. We have a lot to look forward to. Someday soon, we're going to see Jesus. You see, my Savior is alive and well. How do I know it? He lives inside of me. I've talked to Him today. He's spoken to me today. He rules and reigns in my heart. I know that Christ did not stay dead. He came out of the grave alive forevermore. And He's living today. And so with that in mind, I want to bring you to a particular thought where I'd like for us to begin this meeting and it's where John begins his letter in 1 John chapter 1. So look at it with me again, if you will, please. I'm going to read, and every time I stop, I want you to say the next word out loud. I mean, right where you are, right where you're watching and listening. If everybody around you will participate, then nobody will stand out as the only one, all right? So when I stop, say the next word and get a pen in hand. I want you to circle the word in your Bible. It's the same word each time. Look at verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of, what's that word, church? Life. He's the word of life. Circle that in your Bible. Then in verse number 2, for the, what's the next word? Life. The life was manifested, and we've seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal, what's the word, please? Life. So not once, not twice, three times, Jesus Christ is revealed to us here as the life. Look at it, please. In verse 1, He's the Word of life. That's who He is. In verse 2, the life was manifested. That's why He came. He came to reveal God. He came to manifest the very life of God on earth. And then number 3, look at it, please. It's not just life. God says, I'm going to show unto you that eternal life. So not only is life who He is and life why He came, but life is what He gives. And notice the kind of life He gives. I love this. He didn't just give physical life. See, friend, you can have physical life right now, but it can be gone in a moment. Have we noticed in our, in our culture, in our current circumstances, how quickly things can change? Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Oh, my friend, in a moment... You could breathe your last breath here and enter into eternity. Think of our frailty. Think of our mortality. Think of the brevity of life. Physical life can be here, and in a moment it can be gone. Oh, but God doesn't just give you physical life. Look at it, please. He gives you what? Eternal life. Physical life can come and go, but eternal life comes and stays. You see, you receive eternal life not when you die. You receive eternal life at the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. In fact, John chapter 17, verse number 3 says, And this is life eternal, to know God and Jesus Christ whom He has sent. If I ask you, do you have eternal life? I don't mean do you feel good today. I don't mean do you think you're going to live a long time. I don't even mean are you a church member or a religious person. What do we mean by eternal life? Eternal life is not a thing. Eternal life is a person. Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. When we talk about eternal life, eternal life is very simply this. It is knowing God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. And if you don't know God, you don't have eternal life because there are not many ways to have eternal life Eternal life is simply the life of the eternal God living inside of you. And so I ask you today, do you really know Him? Do you have life? Our American way of life has been blessed. We're, we're spoiled, that's what we are. We have been so spoiled that when we have some inconveniences and we've been made uncomfortable, we begin to grumble and complain. Our American way of life, truly, it's been a wonderful thing. And yet I want to remind you of something I hope you're recognizing even at this stage in time, and that is that the American way of life can be disrupted. That's right. The things that you rest on and rely on and trust in in a moment can be gone. But friend, not so with eternal life. Eternal life is our present possession. Eternal life 
is what is ours to build on for time and for eternity. And so I want us to take a good look at Jesus who is our life and I want to speak to you in this hour on this simple subject, what it means to really live. Are you alive? Take a deep breath right now, would you please? Isn't that nice? Go ahead, take another one. Just take another one right now. Isn't that wonderful? It beats the alternative. You're alive today. But I wonder, are you really living? Not just are you alive, are you really living? You see, I would submit to you that many of the people that act like they're living it up are not living it up. They're using it up. They're wasting the one life they have. They're spending their life with no thought of eternity. And I want to say to you on the authority of the Word of God that the only way to really live is to know Jesus Christ. And not just as your Savior. No, even beyond that, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You see, to know the Lord Jesus in His abundance, to live a victorious Christian life, to, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Oh, friends, that's what it means to really live. On August the 25th, 1976, I discovered America. I was born into this world. But five years later, somebody took a Bible and showed me that I needed to be born again, that I needed eternal life. And on that day, I received the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior. And I'm glad to report to you today that all these many years later, Jesus Christ still lives inside of me. As a matter of fact, He's never moved out. You see, the Lord doesn't rent, He buys. And He doesn't move in and out, in and out, in and out. He moves in to stay, and when He moves in, He brings His own furniture. Aren't you glad for that? He brings everything that you need, and He lives inside of me. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Now, let me just tell you what we're doing, all right? In this revival meeting, I believe God has led me to walk you through the little book of 1 John. In every meeting, we're going to read and study from this book. So you can just take your Bible marker and mark your place. You'll know right where we're going in the next meeting. We're going to go back to 1 John again and again. But listen to me, church. We must not go any further than where John begins. The foundation is the person of Jesus Christ. The great work is the work of Jesus Christ. The great knowledge is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if ever there was a time in all of our lives where we ought to go back to the simplicity and sincerity of our faith in Christ and our commitment to Christ, it is right now. Look, everything else is fading away. Everything else is shaking around us. Everything else can be removed in a moment. But the one thing that's never going to change is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Old Vance Havner, that great North Carolina evangelist, used to say that revival was really just one thing. It was God's people falling in love with Jesus all over again. And so one of the things I'm praying for in this meeting is God will help every one of us, this preacher included, to simply fall in love with Jesus all over again. I ask you again, are you really living? Let me show you Christ who is our life. Everybody look at 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1. Let's just walk through it. First of all, he says, that which was from the beginning. Underline that in your Bible, from the beginning. And in the margin of your Bible, I want you to write Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created. So number one, what do we learn about the life that Christ gives? Well, first of all, He was the life of creation. You see, the only life any of us have is the life given us by God. He breathed His own life into the nostrils of man, and we became living souls. The Bible says, in Him we live and move and have our very being. Christ is the life of creation. Jesus didn't begin at Bethlehem. He's the eternal Son of God. He's always been. And so, in Genesis 1 and before the creation, our Lord Jesus, the perfect, beloved Son of God, was right there with the Father and with the Holy Spirit because our God has always been. I'm glad to know in a world where everything is changing, some things are always the same. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Praise God for that. He was the life of creation. Let me prove it to you. Go back with me to Colossians chapter 1 for just a moment. Hope you have your copy of the scriptures there. Follow along with me. Mark this in your Bible. Look at Colossians chapter 1 beginning in verse 15. Paul wrote about Christ 
being the life of creation. Look at Colossians 1 verse 15. Speaking of Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. Now think about this. No man has seen God at any time. Our God is the invisible God. But Jesus Christ is the perfect expression of Him. In Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's the image of the invisible God. Would you like to see God? Oh, yes, I want to see God. Look at Jesus. Would you like to know God? Oh, I want to know God. Know Jesus. Would you like to understand what God is like? Oh, yes, then come to understand what Christ is like because He's the image of the invisible God. But notice how far back He goes. The firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created. Did it ever dawn on you that it was not just the Father who was at work in creation? That it was not just the Spirit of God moving on the face of the waters? That Christ was there? That Christ was present and active in the creation? By Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. I love this. Christ created everything. Christ had everything created for Him. And Christ holds all of creation in the palm of His hand. He's not only the creator, He is the sustainer. He is indeed the very life of everything God has created. I would ask you this, how did God create the world? You know, we preachers, we get pretty artistic at times and we say things like God flung the stars into space and He carved out the rivers with His finger. But in fact, that's not how God created the world. Read it for yourself in Genesis. God just spoke. It's the power of the Word of God. He just said, let there be light. There was light and it was very good. It's the power of one word from God. All right, now look at 1 John again, chapter number 1, and notice who He is. He is the Word, capital W, the Word of life. Christ is the very Word of the living God, the very expression of the mind of God. He is the exact expression of what's on God's heart. From the very beginning, Christ was the life of creation. Here's the second one. Look at verse 1 again. Not only that which was from the beginning, but then read on, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. Look at those interactive words. He said, we see Him and we hear Him. Do you see that? Oh, I love this thought. Christ can be known. He's a personal God. He wants you to see Him. He wants you to hear Him. And so here's the second truth. Would you write it down? Christ is not only the life of creation. Christ is also the life of revelation. Aren't you glad God chose to reveal Himself to man? He could have stayed the hidden God. Sure He could have. Our sins separated us from God, marred our understanding of who God was. Our fallen nature kept us from knowing the glory of God. And God could have left us that way. But I want to say today, thank you, Jesus, you didn't let that happen. Instead, God chose to reveal Himself to man. And how did He do it? God revealed Himself perfectly in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, the veil is taken away. Every, every hindrance is removed and the way is made so that we can know God. Do you know God? Are you really living? Because He's not only the life of creation, He's the life of revelation. This is not just physical, this is spiritual. This is not just about your body. This is about your soul. This is not just about time. This is about eternity. God wants you to know Him. So much so that He says, look at me. Look at me. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The hymn writer had it right. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. He says, listen to me. Who have ears to hear, let him hear. Christ is speaking to us. Is he speaking to you right now? He wants you to know him more personally. Notice, please, what the Bible says in verse 1. It says we've seen him, and then it says we've looked upon him. Is that the same thing? No. Two different words. At first, we, we saw him. In other words, we, we got a general understanding of him. But look at it, please. Then it says we have looked upon him. There is a, there's a choice in this on our part. There there is a fixing of our gaze upon Him. The word here for look literally means to gaze intently upon Him. And I'm thinking now, using a little sanctified imagination, I hope that John had looked at Jesus so many times. He'd stared, he'd gazed at Him, he'd watched every move. 
And he said, I've learned so much from looking at him. Could I challenge you not to take a cursory look at Christ, not to take a peripheral look at God, but gaze upon him, look upon him, look at him today, set your eyes and your affection and your heart upon him and your love upon him as never before. Look at Jesus, friend. Look unto Him and be saved. Look unto Him and be refreshed. Look unto Him and be revived. He is the life of revelation. I love the thought here that John was an eyewitness. There were many eyewitnesses of Christ. Uh, did you know there were no eyewitnesses of creation? Even Adam was not an eyewitness of that. No, he just he came into being one day and discovered all that God had made for him. But aren't you glad that though there were no eyewitnesses of Christ in creation, there were eyewitnesses of Christ in His revelation. God became a man without ceasing to be God so that we could know God personally, so we could set our faith and confidence in Him. And then look at the verse again. The Bible says at the end of the verse, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now what is this about? Would you write this down? He's not only the life of creation and the life of revelation, but is the life of resurrection. This is Resurrection Sunday, but I'll remind you, Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday for a child of God. In fact, let me go further than that. Every day is Resurrection Day for a child of God because Christ lives every day. And so I believe this expression, our hands have handled, is a reminder that is the life of the resurrection. Let me prove that to you. Hold your place here. We're comparing Scripture with Scripture. And go back with me to the Gospel according to Luke for just a moment, to Luke chapter 24. Now, this is how Dr. Luke expressed one of the appearances of Christ after the resurrection. Now, the Bible says in verse 36, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Now look at verse 39, Luke 24, 39. Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself. So he says, look at me. They're already listening to him. Do you see the order here? They're hearing him. Now they're seeing him. But then he goes further. And look at the wording that Jesus uses in verse 39. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Would you mark that little phrase, handle me? Jesus said after the resurrection, go ahead. Go ahead, Thomas. If you want to touch the nail prints, go for it. If you want to thrust your hand into my side, do that. Handle me and see. I believe that the expression in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, John had that in his mind. See, he heard Jesus say that, Luke 24. He was in the room when Jesus said it for the first time. He's just repeating what he's heard, repeating what he's seen, and telling what he's handled. He is saying that Christ was not only there in the creation, and Christ was not only revealed in his earthly life and ministry, Praise God, when he died, he didn't stay dead. He came out of that tomb and he is alive forevermore. He is the life of resurrection. I love the thought that that resurrection life lives inside of you if you're a believer because Christ lives inside of you. Read on, we must hasten. Look at verse number 3. It says, That which we have seen and heard, so we saw it and we heard it in verse 1, but then he goes further, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. So would you write this down that Christ is the life of our declaration. Why am I preaching today? I'm preaching right now in an empty room. Think about that. Uh, but it's not empty. Jesus is here. I'm glad to report to you God's not bound by geography. So the Lord is here with me at this moment and the Lord is there with you at this moment. Why am I preaching like this? Why is my heart stirred? Why is there fervency in my spirit? For the same reason that all of Scripture was given, and that is to declare that Christ is real and He lives and He's at work. Now, why were the apostles so stirred up after the resurrection of Christ? Their declaration grew out of His resurrection. Friend, you see somebody rise from the dead, you'll be excited too. They said in Acts chapter 4, We cannot help but speak the things we've seen and heard. Dear Lord, give us a revival of some Christians that can't help themselves. Uh, give us a revival of some people who are excited about Jesus again, happy to give out a gospel track, ready to give a testimony, glad to share a word for the Lord online. However, through whatever means God gives you to whoever He puts in your path, declare to them, I know Him and He's real. Watch this, please. I've seen Him. I've heard Him. I've handled Him. And now the divine progression is this. I want to declare Him. This was John's message, and it should be the message of every one of us that Christ lives. Look down at verse number 5. 
This then is the message which we've heard of him and declare unto you. We're just relaying what we've received. Look, I have no message. The only message I have is the message I've been given. I'm not the preacher. I'm just the messenger boy. I'm just relaying what I've heard. Let me tell you what I've heard and found to be true. There is a God. He was expressed in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, perfectly. And Christ lives at this moment, and He wants to live in you, and He will change your life if you'll let Him. Christ is our life. And then read on. Notice what the Bible says down in verse 4, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Would you write this down? He's not only the life of creation and revelation and resurrection and declaration, He's also the life of jubilation. Do you see the cheerful note in this verse? He said, I'm writing these things to you. I'm sharing these things with you. So you'll rejoice. And not just any joy, His joy. Not the kind of happiness that circumstances happens to give and can take, and take away. No joy that the world can't give you and the world can't take away. It is Jesus' joy in you. Let me share what I mean. Go back to John with me just for a second. We're going to do a lot of turning back and forth between John and 1 John because comparing Scripture with Scripture, you're going to see so many of these parallel thoughts. But look at John chapter 15 with me for a second. John 15, look at verse number 11. Jesus is speaking. John 15 verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Do something. I want you to underline in verse 11, my joy, your joy. Thank you, Lord, for that. Jesus said, my joy is your joy. My joy is your joy. Our Lord was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but he was also the most joyful man that ever lived. Hebrews says he was anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. Why? Because he knew the eternal reality, the joy that was set before him. And Jesus says, if you'll take me, you won't just get me, you'll get my joy. Oh, I love that. Stop trying to be happy and get to Jesus. The most miserable people I know are people trying to be happy. You don't get happiness by trying to be happy. You find joy by getting Jesus. And when you get Jesus, you get it all. Before we go back to 1 John, stop off in chapter 17 of John just a minute over just one page from where you were. Jesus is praying for us in John 17, verse 13. He says, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Do you see in all these verses, not just joy, full joy, overflowing joy, superabounding joy? Let me just tell you, God never intended His children to endure life. He intended for them to enjoy it. God didn't give you enough to eke through and get by. No, He gives you the joy of the Lord to be your strength. That's what He wants to give you today, my friend. And when real revival comes, one of the things that gets resurrected is the joy of Jesus Christ. People start testifying again and singing again. Sin closes you up, but God opens you up. When you get your heart thoroughly right with God and Christ is in His rightful place, there's a fresh wind, a fresh breath in your soul. What is it? It is the life of jubilation. It is the life of joy. And I would point out to you, do you see that in every one of these verses we're reading here about the Lord's full joy, it's connected to His Word, what He speaks and what He writes? If you're troubled right now and having a hard time, let me give you a suggestion. Turn the news off and pick up the Word of God. Meditate on Scripture. Get back in the Word of God. And I'll tell you what you'll find. You'll find there's joy connected to the Word of God in your life. And what is it? It is the written Word and the living Word, Christ bringing His life and His joy into your heart. Let me show you a couple of things about this jubilation you can mark down. First of all, notice that it's the joy of family. Do you notice all these family terms? He refers to God as the Father. He refers to His Son, Jesus Christ. He talks about little children. This is a family book. This is a family passage. I want to say to you that God gives His own joy to His children. You need to be a child of God. And then, not only be a child, get as close to our Heavenly Papa as you possibly can. That's right. Everybody knows there's a difference between relationship and fellowship. You need a relationship with God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then, you need to have real fellowship with God. And so that's the second thing. This joy is not only connected to family, it's also connected to fellowship. Mark it. In verse 5, do you see the word fellowship? Twice. The word fellowship is found again in verse 6. Again in verse number 7, what is this? The idea is if you'll get as close to God as you can and just fellowship with the Lord, nothing between you and God, God says one of the fruits of that is I will give my joy to you. 
Would you like the Lord's joy again? Then get everything out of God's way. Everything that hinders prayer, everything that holds back the blessing, everything that grieves the sweet Holy Spirit of God, and you'll find Christ's life, His jubilation at work in your heart again. Let me give you another quickly. Look at verse 5 and verse 6 with me. This then is the message which we heard of Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Would you write this down? Christ is not only the life of creation and revelation and resurrection and declaration and jubilation. He's the life of illumination. He turns the light on. I love this fact that the same Christ who is life is also light. The connection between life and light. You've got to have light to live. And our Christ comes and He says, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn heaven's spotlight on your soul. You see, God is light. As a matter of fact, in this same book we learn God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. But watch please in chapter number 1. Not only is He the light, but He sheds His light on us. Would you let Christ shed heaven's light on you right now? In the dark places of your soul, in the, in the shadows, in the secret places, in the cracks and crevices of your mind where nobody goes, would you let the all-searching light of Christ invade there and do that illuminating work? We say sometimes, let's... Let a light in on this subject. Let's turn a light on. We may open a curtain to let some light in. Oh, let me tell you what happens. When you open the Word of God and then you open your heart to the God of the Word, the light begins to penetrate and purge. God begins to search and to cleanse. Because Christ does a thorough work, He is the light and the life of illumination. And so that brings me to the final thing that we see of Christ in this opening chapter because aren't you glad He not only shows you where you are, He doesn't leave you there. Aren't you glad God loves you right where you are, but He doesn't leave you there? Notice what the Bible says. Read on, look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. I like that. Put your finger on that verse and claim that one today. All means all, and that's all all means. All sin, all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. Would you write this down, please? Christ is the life of purification. You see, the light shows where the dirt is, but then the Lord says, all right, now we're going to cleanse that. We're going to take care of that. Look, please, the Lord doesn't just show you your need. He meets the need. He not only shows you your sin, He shows you how you can be right. He not only points, He draws. Thank you for that, Lord. He draws you closer to Himself. Look, please, when the Lord Jesus Christ begins to do a thorough work in you, He doesn't make you a little better. He makes you totally new. When you get saved, you become a new person in Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But I want you to know as a believer the rest of your life, He's in that divine remodeling project making all things new in your life, getting the junk out of your life, everything that doesn't look like Jesus, and putting in everything that does look like the beautiful Son of God. Notice our part and His part. Our part is one thing. It is confession. It just says, if we confess. Now, that's a big if. Are you willing to be right with God? Are you willing to say about your sin what God says about your sin? Years ago, I made a little study of this word confess. I thought I knew what it meant. Don't ever assume you know what God means. Study it. I thought, and I'd heard preachers preach the word confess like you plead with God and, and pray and tell God how sorry you are. And, and then it's the idea you almost convince God, all right, I'm ready to be forgiven. That's not what the word confess means. The word confess is so simple but so profound, it literally means say the same thing. And look at the verse. When you say the same thing about your sin God says about it, God says, forgiven and cleansed. He'll do His part. Will you do yours? Would you be willing today to confess your sin? Not your family's sin, not your country's sin, not your neighbor's sin. Would you be willing to confess your sin? Don't call it something else. Call it what God calls it. Don't make an excuse for it. Confess it. Come clean with God. Watch this. And the minute you come clean with God, God makes you clean. Because look, please, our part is confession. His part is cleansing. And the word here is in the present tense. The blood of Jesus Christ goes on cleansing us from all sin. Look, I need to get clean every day. I need to get clean today. You need to get clean today. 
Now, the worst thing that can happen to any of us, we think we've been saved long enough, we're on autopilot, we're professional Christians, we can coast into glory. Uh, Nonsense. No, friend, I need to be made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ today. Would you let Christ be thorough with you at this moment? This is Resurrection Sunday, and I thank the Lord for it, but I want to challenge you. Don't just visit the empty tomb today. Live with the risen Christ. Don't just visit the empty tomb and pay homage and respect to the fact Christ rose from the dead and give mental assent and nod your head and say amen. No, no, no. Let Christ live His resurrection, holy life in and through you. I tell you, this is really what revival is. It's resurrection power at work in all of our lives. And I wonder today, will you choose life? May I ask you again? Are you really living? I mean, really living? Are you where you need to be with Jesus Christ? Is Christ in His rightful place in your life? Because I can't think of a better day, and I can't think of a better time in history for all of us to get thoroughly right with God than this moment. I love the great hymns of the faith, and I love the great resurrection songs. And there are certain hymns that we sing frequently at Easter, and I think that's good. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Christ arose, Christ the Lord is risen today, all great hymns. But I was looking through some of the old hymns recently in preparation for this Resurrection Sunday, and I came across one of the great hymns that Charles Wesley wrote. Wesley's hymns were full of doctrine, full of Bible truth. And I came to a hymn that I I don't really know how it goes as far as the tune, but I know the tone, it's victorious. I don't know exactly how to sing it. You're probably thanking God for that. I'm not going to sing it to you, but... Let me just read you some of the words. Wesley wrote, I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. A token of His love He gives, a pledge of liberty. I find Him lifting up my head. He brings salvation near. His presence makes me free indeed, and He will soon appear. He wills that I should wholly be. What can withstand His will? The counsel of His grace in me, He surely shall fulfill. Listen to me, friend. I know that my Redeemer lives. And I not only know He lives, I know He lives in me. And I not only know He lives in me, I know He wants to bring my life in line with His life. I ask you again, are you really living? Would you be willing today to give Christ, who is our life, His rightful place in your life? Our Father, I thank You for the Word of God that lives and abides forever. And I pray, Lord, I pray at this moment the Holy Spirit will transcend geography, will go beyond our circumstances and will touch the hearts of people and connect the truth of 1 John chapter 1 to so many individuals at this moment. Please do that, Lord. And may all of us say a mighty yes to Jesus. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed in a spirit of prayer right where we are. In the stillness and quietness of this moment, I'd like to ask every person that's watching and listening to this message, I'd like to ask every person to join me in a prayer to God. In fact, I'm going to ask you to join me in one of two prayers. The first prayer is for those of you that are not certain that Jesus Christ lives in you. You're not certain that your sins are forgiven. You're not sure if you died today that you'd go to heaven. You have some doubt about it. You need to get it settled today. And Jesus Christ is the only way. He will give you eternal life now as a free gift if you'll receive Him by faith. He didn't just die. He died for your sins. He didn't just rise from the dead. He rose from the dead so you could be saved. Would you receive Him right now as your personal Savior? If that's your need, would you join me in this prayer right where you are from your heart? Would you pray to God? He's listening. Would you say to Him, Dear God, I'm a sinner. Without Jesus, I cannot go to heaven, but I don't want to go to hell. Forgive me. Come into my heart. I receive you now as my personal Savior. I trust you. Thank you for dying for me. And thank you for giving me your eternal life. Friend, if you just prayed that prayer from your heart, I'm going to give you a verse The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you take that verse as your own today? Jesus said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now I want to speak to those of you who already know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. 
And we're looking at this beautiful family book, and you're in the family of God, and I'm so glad. And I'm going to ask you, would you get closer to your Father? Would you confess all known sin, and would you say to the Lord, I want Christ to have His rightful place in me, and I want that eternal, abundant life to be in a fresh and real way big in my life? I want to pray for you, and while I pray for you, don't listen to me pray. I want you to pray right where you are. Let's all go to the throne of grace together. Would you pray right now? Our Father, I pray with and for our brothers and sisters in Christ that at this moment there will be a renewal of our vows to a holy God, a moment of rededication, that on this Resurrection Sunday there will be a spiritual reset in all of our lives to bring us back to truly loving Christ and following Christ and obeying Christ. Father, would you set some things in motion this day that will last for all eternity? Only you can do that, Lord. We trust you to do it through the power of your word and by your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let me give you just a closing personal word. You've been very patient to listen in this hour, and I thank you for it. A couple of things. First of all, if you prayed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ today as your Savior, or if you need spiritual counsel, you need to talk to somebody, you have questions and you need some help, I want to challenge you to reach out to this church. Now, these are God-fearing, Bible-loving people filled with the love of God. They'll pray with you, they'll encourage you, they'll do everything they can to help you, and we'd like to hear about it. Personally, I would love to hear that someone has come to trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior on this Easter Sunday through this Bible message. So I'm going to ask you, make a phone call, send an email, send a message, but reach out to them and let them know so that we can rejoice with you. And then, if you're a member of this church family, I want you to know that I'm praying for you. And I'm excited about studying the Word of God with you this week. We get three evenings together, and we're going to have a great time, and it all is going to come, God willing, from the book of 1 John. So I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to give you a homework assignment. I'm going to ask you right there at home to read through the book of 1 John. You may read it together as a family. You may read it in your devotional time, but read through the book of 1 John. And as we come to meet together in the next hour, we're going to come right back to this portion of the Word of God and ask the Lord to speak to us in a definite way. I'm looking forward to it and praying that God will send all of us a real revival through His Word this week. God bless you.